a true love story, windshield wipers optional. The windshield is very clean, as you guys can see, in some parts. God loves you. This phrase is one that you guys have probably heard throughout your entire life. I heard it so much growing up that I started rolling my eyes in a very dismissive kind of way. I was very self-centered and selfish growing up, and still to this day I have those traits. My wife can attest to that. I was selfish because I did not have a lot of things growing up. I didn't have the fanciest clothes, I didn't have the fanciest toys, cars, parents. I had my grandparents, and they loved me as their own. And that was a really nice feeling. It was awesome, but that wasn't what I needed. I was selfish and self-centered because as far as I was concerned, at the end of the day, I only had myself to rely on. My biological parents didn't want me, so what could I really be worth? It didn't matter how much love my grandparents gave me or showed me, I would still have that hold in my heart. God loves you. This phrase only aggravated me because I wasn't feeling the love. If God and Jesus really loved me, then why was my life like a puzzle missing half of its pieces? That was a question that I asked myself over and over again, and I never got an answer that satisfied me. I grew up in church because it was important to my grandma. I knew all the stories, I knew all the right things to say, but it didn't mean anything to me. It wasn't important to me. I acted out, I did things that I shouldn't have, um, a lot of things that I regret. I lived my life the way I wanted to live it. If I didn't have all the pieces of my puzzle, I was going to create and add my own pieces wherever I could make them fit. I lived for myself. I lived for the world. God loves you. I really doubted that. After all the stunts that I had pulled in my life, I could barely tolerate myself. How could anyone ever love me? But you see, that's the funny thing. That is the most amazing thing about God's love. Because he loves us even when we don't think we're worthy to be loved. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn in Hosea chapter 1, and if you don't have one, that's okay, it'll be up here. We're going to start in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Bere, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. Now the first thing to take note here is that the word of the God, the word of God, came to Hosea. This is actually a big deal, because during this time, this isn't an everyday occurrence. This is special. This was important. So, God has spoken to Hosea. Picking up in verse 2, it says, When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman, and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, the land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. So God has spoken to Hosea and basically said, Hey, I want you to go marry a prostitute. And, oh, by the way, I also want you to have children with her. It's a really odd request. Um, it's almost like a bad punchline to a joke because it's so ridiculous. God has spoken to plenty of people throughout the Bible, but there aren't too many requests just like this. But notice that God explains to Hosea why he wants him to do this. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. How many of you guys have ever heard of Israel? Yeah. They were God's chosen people. They were his crew. They were his posse. But they were dumb. They did not do what they were supposed to. They were told time after time to do something. And they would do the opposite. They even worshipped other gods. And they still had all this proof in front of them of the one true God. But that didn't matter. They did what they wanted. They lived for themselves. So just like Israel is unfaithful to God, God knows in advance that Gomer is going to be unfaithful to Hosea. 
And what kind of a name is Gomer anyway? Gomer actually means complete. The root word is gamar, and it's a verb. Gamar means to perfect or to finish. Interestingly enough, Hosea actually means salvation or he saves. So Hosea does what he's told. He marries Gomer, and Gomer gave him a son. Hosea has done exactly, exactly what God has asked of him at this point. Back to verse 4. It says, Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. And that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her lo which means not loved. For I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them. Not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. After she had weaned lo Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him lo which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together. They will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So the three children's names basically mean a reminder of a massacre at a valley, not loved, and not my people. Not very sunshine and rainbow type names, to be sure. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. This is not Hosea talking about Gomer. This is God talking about the Israelites. Even after everything the Israelites have done, he still has a soft spot for his chosen people. He still wants a relationship with them. He hasn't written them off completely. In verse 16 it says, In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. God doesn't want to have to rule the Israelites like a dictator. He doesn't want to be barking out orders at them constantly. He wants a relationship with them. But that's still not something that they're understanding. In verse 19, it says, I will betroth you to me forever. Now, this is an interesting word because in Hosea's time, betroth basically meant engagement. And engagement in that time period had a lot more weight to it. Those words are actually powerful. God wants an everlasting relationship with his people. In some cases, the word engagement was more powerful than the word marriage. So it's important that it's being said right here. God loves you. Getting back to Hosea and Gomer's relationship in chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lethic of barley. Then I told her, You are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. Some time has passed between chapters 1, 2, and 3. We're not exactly sure how much time, but enough time for Gomer to leave Hosea, go out into the world, and for Hosea to miss his wife and go after her. Gomer gave Hosea the children as God knew she would, and Gomer also left to go out into the world as God knew she would. The Bible says that at this point she was still an adulteress, still a prostitute, and yet, despite all of that, God told Hosea to go get his wife and to bring her back home. To love her as he loves the Israelites. So Hosea goes out and finds Gomer 
And he can't just bring her home, even though that's his wife. He actually has to buy her back because she's become someone else's property. It's implied that in her time in the world, she's become a slave. God loves you. God knew. He knew that Hosea was going to have to pay a price to bring Gomer back home. And Hosea paid the price, as God knew he would. And Gomer goes home again, as God knew she would. And notice what Hosea said to her. You are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will behave the same way towards you. Hosea forgave his wife. He started over with her. It didn't matter what she had done. It didn't matter that she had left to go out and live in the world. It didn't matter that she had cheated. Hosea went out. He paid the price. And he brought her back home. It didn't matter how worthless Gomer felt. He was always going to pay that price to bring her back home. As much as Hosea's relationship with Gomer illustrates God's relationship with the Israelites, it also does one other thing. It illustrates God's relationship with us. Think about this. God knows in advance, 100%, every time, without a doubt, that we are going to cheat on him. Every day for as long as we live. Can you imagine being in a relationship like that with someone? Knowing that there wasn't a tiny chance, there wasn't a medium chance, wasn't a giant chance, it was going to happen. This person was going to cheat on you. But you're not just choosing to stay in that relationship for a little bit, you're staying in that relationship every day for the rest of your life. That's what was happening here, because... 100%, without a doubt, God knew that Gomer was going to cheat on Hosea. He knew it. He knew the Israelites were going to cheat on him. But it didn't stop him. I don't know how many people would stay in that situation, especially every day for as long as you live. There aren't too many people who would subject themselves to that kind of punishment. And yet God makes that choice every single day for as long as we live because that's how much he loves us. God loves you. That love doesn't come without a price though. You guys know that. God loves us so much that he sent his only son to die on, on the cross for our sins so that we just have a chance at having a relationship with him again. And we make him pay that price every single day. Every time we sin, every time we cheat on God, we put Jesus back on that cross. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 tells us, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Think of it like this. Our lives at times are kind of like a windshield on a car that, over time, it builds up dirt and smudges and just gradually gets filthier and filthier the longer we go without cleaning it. And God is like the windshield wiper, constantly cleaning and purifying that windshield back to its original state. And notice it's not a one-time thing. It's a process that has to happen over and over again. Most people are capable of only loving you halfway. We may try to love others unconditionally, but there is no way that we will ever be able to love one another as perfectly as God loves us. Because we're not perfect. His love for you and me is different than any love you or I will ever experience. God loves you. Some people think, yeah, God loves me. So what? He has to. Big deal. He loves everybody. I want to make something clear to you right now. 
God loves you. And it's not because he got stuck with you. It's not because you're part of this big, massive crowd of people. God loves you and chooses you. He wants to have a relationship with you, each and every one of you. No matter what you have done, no matter what your life has been like, God loves you. And the love that he has to offer, it's not a half love like we sometimes give to each other. It's more of a 100%, all in, every time, no matter what kind of love. When I was in fourth grade, we did a Valentine's Day musical for our school. And one of the songs that we sung was, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. How many of you guys have ever heard of it? Yeah, we got one person. It's an old song. Not to say anything about that. However, this is a special song because it goes something like this. Tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. It's been three long years. Do you still want me? Obviously, my singing skills are wonderful. <laughs> The song is interesting enough um, to be done at a fourth grade Valentine's Day play because this song talks about a man who had been sent to prison. Uh, we don't know exactly what this man did to end up in prison, but we can assume that it was probably something pretty bad. He was in prison! He's even written to tell the one who once loved him that he knows she has every right to reject him. He knows he's to blame. And he's also written to tell her that, you know, if she loves him, if she wants to start fresh, to start over, to go out and to tie a yellow ribbon around this old oak tree. And as he's coming by on the bus, coming home from prison, if he sees this yellow ribbon, he'll know that she forgives him and he can get off the bus and they can start fresh again. They can start a new life together. So as the miles roll by and this man is sitting on the bus, he starts to get all panicky starts to get fidgety. He starts to get twitchy. He doesn't know what's going to happen when he sees this tree. Is there going to be a yellow ribbon on it? What if there isn't? What if there is? What happens then? The song, though, ends in triumph for the man as he sees, as he gets closer to the tree. The entire busload of people cheer on as the man sees not one yellow ribbon, but a hundred yellow ribbons around this old oak tree. His lover not only forgave him, but she passionately, excitingly welcomed him back home. And that's the same way that God's relationship with us works. There is nothing too bad that we are ever going to do in God's eyes to make him stop loving us. While our sins appear to us at times to be unforgivable, God is always, always going to be there with the yellow ribbon to remind us that there is nothing that we can do to make him stop loving us forever and ever and ever. It didn't matter what Gomer had done. It didn't matter what the Israelites had done. It didn't matter what I had done. It doesn't matter how worthless we might feel sometimes. God loves us. You cannot change the past or undo any of the things that cause you to feel unloved. All you can do is just reach out and accept God's love. Accept the yellow ribbon he has for you. Let him clean your windshield every once in a while. And go on your way with him, side by side, ready to start fresh again. God loves you. You guys are dismissed.